This is the Egret 2 Mini Limited Blue Edition system from Taito. Now, of course, the craze that is Mini systems has died down in more recent years after peaking with Sega and Nintendo fanboys battling it out with their Mega Drive or Genesis Minis against the Super Nintendo or Super Famicom Minis. And in more recent years, we have been getting far more collectible and, to be fair, far more expensive systems like this. And once again, Sega is going to be battling it out with their 2020 released Astro City Mini going up against the almost exactly the same looking Egret 2 Mini. They're the same picture. <laughs> nope, don't listen to Pam, because this machine can do this. Come on, that's cool, right? So sit back and relax, grab a box of tissues and prepare to get excited even more as I talk you through in depth what this latest system has to offer. The Egret 2 Mini is of course a mini version of the Egret 2 arcade unit released in 1996 where it grew in popularity among arcade owners due to its easier to swap out arcade boards and rotatable monitors which is the preferred way to play a huge variety of older and newer games. This is of course a hugely scaled down version of that machine that's obviously not entirely accurate, but the most important features are here. You obviously only have one eight directional arcade stick with multiple buttons as opposed to the original arcade unit allowing for two players. However, what I did notice, which I thought was super cool, was a switch that changed it up from eight directions to four or vice versa. And the reason I didn't notice this straight away was because this is a review unit. It's probably about time that I talk you through what I can and cannot say about the Egret 2 Mini. Firstly, shout out to United Games for sending this machine over for the purposes of the review. I'll leave a couple of links below as to where you can find one yourself at GameRocket.com. You can get the Egret 2 Mini Limited Blue Edition bundle for just under 200 euros roughly or 165-ish pounds. You can also get additional controllers, the extra 10 games, which I will explain more in a little bit, and the bigger arcade stick. Additionally, you can also make your way over to StrictlyLimitedGames.com where they have two big old bundles filled with extra controllers, music CDs, backdrops and a whole lot more. It's significantly more expensive but of course, you know, collectors are going to collect, am I right? Links to everything I just mentioned are all down below. One of the things I sadly cannot show off here today is the box. I can't show you what the packaging looks like or even how it was packaged to begin with due to it not being finalised at this point, which makes sense as the packaging didn't exactly match up with what I got inside the box anyway. Anyway, plus, I did not get the instruction cards for each game to put on top of the machine, and my instructions were not even in English, so uh, <laughs> yeah, all very early stuff here. Besides that guys, this is 100% my review. The good people that sent it to me did not see this video before you guys are seeing it. Uh, there was no money exchanged in regard to this review. This is 100% my review, and I'm allowed to be as brutal as I want. So let's get on with it. One of the major selling points to the Egret Mini is the rotatable screen, which is actually pretty heavy. This isn't something that's going to be snapping off easily from what I can tell, but at the same time, it makes a louder clunk noise than you may expect. And that short glimpse you get behind the screen while spinning it around does really show off what's going on behind the unit every single time you twist it. I'm not sure how easy it is to see, but this thing has a huge spring behind it, which you can actually hear creaking every time you twist it. To be clear here guys, this isn't something that I'm worried about, in fact it's quite the opposite. This system is a lot beefier and more heavy duty than any machine that came before it. Although I'm sure no one out there is buying this for their kids, it could most definitely take a beating, or at least it looks like it can. In fact it's quite a bit heavier than the Astro City Mini which makes sense as it's quite a bit larger and deeper than that unit too, with even the control stick or at least the ball on top of the control stick being bigger as well. 
When you turn on the machine, you're greeted to the Taito logo, followed by the Egret 2 Mini logo. And what was surprising to me at first was just how stunningly clear the screen is on this thing. It really is quite breathtaking. You're breathtaking. <laughs> you're breathtaking. And by the way, if you turn this thing on sideways in vertical mode, when you actually switch on the machine, that Taito logo and the Egret 2 Mini logo show up sideways before the menu kicks in, and then that's all up the right way. It's a bit odd. Hey, it's worth pointing out. Now, regarding the twisting of that machine, it only changes orientation after you've actually pushed in the screen itself, which tells me this isn't done by motion the same way your phone or tablet is done, but instead, it's mechanical. And more importantly, it actually doesn't matter which way you twist it, every single game will load up based on your orientation. It's a smooth transition that doesn't black out or affect the gameplay, you do it at any time, and it simply works a charm. In fact, it works a little too too well, as it ended up actually being quite addictive, way more than it should have been. The only negative I have with the screen is that unlike the Astro City Mini, that has a black border around the screen before reaching the plastic edge, is that the Egret instantly hits the plastic edge. It's flush. Therefore, in some games, if your eye line is high, then the text at the top of the screen will be ever so slightly obscured by the plastic edge. Sure, it's just a nitpick here, but hey, I did notice it. Besides all of that, the machine has stereo sound coming out of the front, which sounds very nice and not too tinny. The games play perfectly fine using the controls as you expect, and you can also connect this thing to your TV via an HDMI for the big screen experience if you wish. Now, my machine didn't come with any extras like controllers or whatever that would go in the back via USB. I tried so many controllers, and the only one that worked for me was the Astro City controller. Something to keep in mind if you've already got a pair of those things. Anyway, that's the machine itself. Before I give off my final thoughts, let's take a look at all of the games found on this bad boy, and we're going to do it in date order, which means we've got to start off with... Space Invaders, released in 1978, easily the most iconic game on the list and arguably one of the most influential games ever made. You literally have hundreds of ports and sequels to this game and it all started with this one. Lunar Rescue was released a year later in 1974 and used the same hardware as the previously mentioned game, your ship falls from the top of the screen and your aim is to land it on one of the several platforms, pick up a survivor and make your way back up to the top of the screen whilst dodging the asteroid field on the way down and shooting enemy crafts on the way up. It's unsurprisingly very addictive and a welcome addition to any collection, including this one. Steel Worker is next, released in 1980 and is a massive departure from Taito's typical shooter game, as instead what you've got here is a very, very primitive Lemmings game. Click the direction you want your stairs to go in and try and make it across whilst dodging random hazards on your way. For me, I've always found this more frustrating than enjoyable, but it's an important shift in the company's history and for that, I'm happy it's here. The same year, Japanese gamers also got Lupin, the third, the first of many games based on the popular anime series that was at the height of its popularity at this time. You control the main character, the thief, grabbing bags of money from the top of the screen and then bringing them down to the bottom of the screen, dodging everything in your path on your way. Essentially what you've got here is a reverse Frogger with a maze-like layout in the middle. It was never released in the UK originally and now it is, I mean, it's all right. It's actually hardly worth checking out, to be fair. 1981 came round and Quicks came with it. Yep, Quicks, the game that started it all. All being those dodgy main ROMs that we've all tried out. Well, actually, not me, but most definitely you, you pervert. It's a simple enough game where you control a marker on the edge of the screen and draw a box on the inside of the screen without getting hit, trying to take away all of the enemy's playing space. It's a quality and very addictive little title. 
Pirate Pete in 1982 was the result of Taito releasing Jungle King the same year, a vine-swinging Tarzan-like game that resulted in legal action being taken against them. This resulted in a rename and a reskin to Jungle Hunt, and yet another renaming and reskin to Pirate Pete. And that's what we got on here. You know when in pretty much every 2D game you end up grabbing hold of a swinging rope requiring you to jump correctly at the right time to grab hold of a yet another swinging rope that's what this game is well at first you then land in the water where you mass murder a load of sharks you then run up a slope dodging boulders and snakes before you save your girlfriend from cannibal pirates at the very end revealing that your only good eye is actually the one underneath your patch okay personally even though it is a bit clunky i actually really like the variety on this game and even though from my research actually jungle hunt was the far more popular game this is without a doubt the best looking one and i'm again glad it's on this machine adventure canoe came out the same year released overseas apparently and um well this is the first time i've actually ever played this one because it's one of a couple of games on this system that you simply cannot emulate correctly it's never been dumped so feeling pretty chuffed that I'm finally playing it, the end result is... Nah, <laughs> it's not very good at all, actually. It's very sluggish. You hit one button repeatedly to go upstream and another to shoot tribes people that all want you dead. In that sense, it's kind of like a shmup, but one where you constantly need to fight your way to simply just go up the screen. Elevator action, now we're talking. Released in 1983, this is such an awesome game. You start at the top of the building and you make your way down shooting bad guys and going in every single red door that you see. It's as simple as that. However, after you play it, you will soon become absolutely obsessed with the gameplay styles found here. This, as stated, is an awesome game and easily one of the highlights of this entire cabinet. Chuck and Pop came out the same year, a bit of a confusing entry, but an important entry nonetheless, as it kind of birthed the entire Bubble Bobble series, depending on who you ask. And therefore, from a history standpoint, it's an absolute no-brainer to be included. You not so basically scour these maze-like levels looking for hearts and dropping bombs and dodging enemies. You do this by clinging onto the floor and ceiling and, well, that's really it. It's a tricky entry and one that's really hard to explain. Once you get used to it, it's all right. But for me, yeah, it just makes me want to play Bubble Bobble instead. 1984's Outer Zone is the second game from the list to be somewhat exclusive to this machine, as in you can't emulate it as of the recording of this video. So it was quite exciting to try this one out here. And the result is actually a pretty solid experience. It takes a while to get used to as you need to make sure that you're constantly flipped around the correct way to shoot your projectiles as you traverse around a very complicated isometric map, shooting all of the towers required before moving on to the next map. I see myself actually playing this one quite a bit. The Fairyland story arrived in 1985 and just like Chuck and Pop before it, it served as the basis to the legendary Bubble Bobble series, which we will get to in just a bit. And because of this, of course, this one is actually largely forgotten. It's a charming little title that honestly I never gave enough time to before creating this video. You have a very short range magic spell that turns enemies into cakes which you can then use to crush enemies. It's so Bubble Bobble, arguably not as good, but hey, it's still nice to have. The Legend of Cage, or the Legend of Kage as it's apparently pronounced, came out in 1985 and honestly, I'm not the biggest fan. An extremely hard to control ninja shuriken shoot em up where you run from right to left, surprisingly, doing these enormous jumps that often find you headbutting enemy projectiles. I'm sure I can probably get good at this one, but right now I am not a fan. 1986's Halley's Comet, which by the way was the last year that this comet was visible, bring on 2061 for its return, a little history lesson there from Wikipedia, I mean, uh, Slopes Game Room for you. This game is an awesome little title. This is why you buy systems like this, to discover games like this. So it's essentially a vertical shooter, a hard vertical shooter, but what makes it unique is that meter that you can see on the side of the screen. The closer your comet gets to you, the closer you are to the comet, obviously. You then shoot the comet open and destroy it from the inside by defeating the boss. In the first stage, you need to save Earth and every single enemy that goes past you shows up as damage towards planet Earth. 
Earth, giving this title an extra layer of depth. Anyway, after you defeat the boss, you move on to the next stage and save another planet from the solar system. This really is a gem for this system. I cannot suggest you guys trying this one out enough. It's very addictive. Bubble Bobble came out in 1986, and besides Space Invaders, this is easily one of the most iconic on the list. You shoot bad guys with bubbles in little maze-like platforming levels and then pop them to reveal fruit or power-ups before continuing on. It's a game my whole family loved to play, and it's an absolute must. Kiki Kai Kai also came out in 1986 and is yet another shoot 'em up similar to a game I am far more familiar with called The Ninja on the Master System, but this is probably the better game. You're on foot, you shoot bad guys with your shurikens in all eight directions and make your way around the map until you get to the boss, it's a fun little game and it's definitely worth playing. 1986's Scramble Formation, better known in the West as simply Tokyo, is, you guessed it, another shmup. At first glance, it's a forgettable title with very little going on in the music department and graphics, etc. But what makes this stand out is the power ups. Grab a little red drone, and that drone will then join you. Do this four times, and you have a formation of drones surrounding you, which you get to change the formation of on the fly, depending on the situation or your playstyle. It's a very impressive shooter that you're likely to pass off in any particular ROM list, but really get stuck into if you give it enough time. Rustan Saga came out in 1987, and yep, this is another absolute gem. A side-scrolling hack and slash with multiple enemies coming in constantly to attack you. It's got great music, great graphics, and was actually the first game that I ended up trying out on the system because, yeah, I really like this game. 1987's Twin Cobra, also known as Kaio Koyuku Tiger, I think, is a super important game to be included. Sure, the later Toa Plan games are, in my opinion, the better titles, but this Tiger Heli follow-up really does show that the company is worth keeping an eye on. It's a pretty standard, I suppose, by today's standards, but from a historical point of view, it's great to have it on here, especially if you're like me and you mostly remember playing the Mega Drive port. This one is simply the better way to play it. 1988's Ray Maze is another classic from the arcades where you run around a maze like screen collecting dots and trying to dodge the bad guys. On western shores, it saw moderate success, but back in the day in Japan, it proved to be one of the more popular machines upon release. A nice addition to the collection. Hell yes, Rainbow Islands is on here, or to be more specific, Rainbow Islands Extra, released in 1988. Many people relate this version to the rather underwhelming Mega Drive release, but in fact, this is the more unknown arcade release, which is actually the same gameplay-wise, but with different enemy placements and boss order to the original. Personally, I would have preferred the original to be on here, but it's cool. You go up a vertically shifting level, shooting rainbows at bad guys and picking up the items that they drop. The nostalgia is hardcore for me with this one, and I was so happy to see it included on this list. The New Zealand Story was released in 1988, and again, the nostalgia is strong with this one. A rather brutal in this one hit in your dead platformer, where you control a Kiwi called Tiki and try and make your way to the end of a very oddly laid out platforming stage. You got a lot of variety in the weapons you have at your disposal in this, and it's simply super addictive. Tatsujin, better known as Truxton, again mostly remembered for its Mega Drive release. This 1988 arcade original really did put the company Toraplan on the map, arguably more than any other game before it. However, just like Twin Cobra before it, the mechanics are pretty simple. You have a selection of weapons you can pick up, but besides that, it's shoot and bomb everything in sight. A fantastic addition that I'm sure all players will enjoy on this machine. 1989 brings with it Don Doko Don, another amazing title, although when put on the same list as Bubble Bobble, you really do see that it is yet again another example of Taito trying to do Bubble Bobble again, but this time with a hammer. That's literally it, guys. It's still great fun to play, but it's essentially the same style of game yet again. 
whereas Violence Fight is completely different to everything before and after on this list. Again released in 1989, this terrible one-on-one -on -one fighter brought with it 8 player movements meaning that you can go in front and behind your enemy to take them down, giving off a kind of blend between a typical Street Fighter clone with a Streets of Rage clone. Still the end result, although looking very good with smooth animations, are quite terrible and in no way at all enjoyable to play. Kandash is next up and again is a completely different experience to what else is on this list, that being an action role playing game which is completely baffling for an arcade game for the time. It became a lot more standard as years went on in Japan, however, there's no point having it on this machine. <laughs> Do you get the impression that this machine was never originally intended to come to western shores? Because this is completely unplayable unless you can read Japanese. You do have dip switches before you load up games, but I did check and note you cannot translate this to English. So um, yeah, a pretty stupid game to have on here. However, you know, it does have the SD card slot on the side, so maybe they'll update it so it can be translated into English. Who knows? Regardless, right now, it's completely pointless. 1989's Volvive? I don't know is essentially a quick spin-off with a more sci-fi feel. Not really much else to say, except that it is, again, quite a fun game. As we move into the 90s, we got Liquid Kids Adventure, a game I recently played for Anstream and a game I absolutely love. It's again a 2D platformer where you control very typical, by this point, Taito's cutesy characters, shooting water bombs at enemies before you knock into them and hopefully they all ricochet off each other. It's an extremely slow game, but it's the mechanics that help it along. Definitely worth playing. The same year we got Gun Frontier, another shmup, this time set in the future year of 2120, which has resulted in us looking like cowboys due to some failed gold rush on another planet. I don't know. Regardless, this obviously now means that we all fly around in gun-shaped planes and the game itself is a actually great little shooter. Nothing overly special in regards to its gameplay, but fun nonetheless with a quality setting that few others replicate in this way. 1990s Run Arc or Growl as it's known in the West is another side scrolling beat em up that is unique not only in its setting, I mean it's essentially Indiana Jones, where you fight off a crazy amount of bad guy poachers. Seriously, the amount of characters on screen at once can get a little overwhelming, the fighting itself is a little bit naff if I'm going to be honest, but the weapons you pick up more than make up for it. As a fan of the genre, this is one that I have actually played through a few times and although it's far from the top of the list, it's definitely one that I've gone back to time and time again. Patrick Hero is one of the only times you're ever going to hear me praise a footy game, but this one, known as Footy Champ in other parts of the world in 1990, is an awesome little retro football experience that still holds up remarkably well. Obviously, your mileage will vary depending on how much you like the sport, but for me, someone that doesn't like the sport, I actually really do like this game. For our final 1990s game, we have Ninja Kids, which is a side-scrolling beat-em-up that plays extremely similar to Simpsons the Arcade Game and about 700 games that also play like that. This one falls right in the middle, giving off a sort of meh, it's okay gameplay style, not bad, just not memorable. It's fine. 1991's Metal Black is a game you absolutely must play because it's freaking awesome. Honestly, the game is pretty simple with its mechanics, with you only really needing to upgrade your base weapon, but its simplicity means that it's a perfect pick up and play title that everybody can enjoy, still offering gameplay that will heavily test the more hardcore among you. 1993's Ray Force is another highly respected shooter that's a tad more technical than others on the list. You've got your standard shoot which of course powers up the more you pick up and you have your lock on secondary weapon too. The gameplay style can get a bit frantic as the majority of shmups did for the time and this one is a fantastic little game. 1994's Kazer Knuckle was a one-on-one -on -one fighter that would be dropped into an oversaturated world of fighting games and I mean it's nice it's on here for variety's sake but as someone that isn't even a fan of the genre in the first place all that much, especially games that completely fell off the radar compared to the big boys, I'm probably not the best person to review this one. Hey, it looks nice, sorry, just being honest. 
1994 also saw Darius Gaiden, a stunning entry to the franchise and one that I play quite frequently compared to others in this series. Sure, you don't have your super long screen arcade go as it used to, but in this place you have some of the best looking graphics to date. Never has shooting aliens that look like ugly fish felt so good. Keeping it in 1994, Bubble Symphony or Bubble Bobble 2 is... Yep, it's another Bubble Bobble game. That's it, really. Look, I mean, it's not bad. It's just the, um, what, the fourth game in this collection so far that's like this? Hey, regardless, it's a very well-respected game, and therefore, hey, you, yeah, you should play it. Ah, oh, yes. Elevator Action Returns. This game, guys, is arguably the very best game on this list. I love Elevator Action Returns. It really does not get enough love. In fact, I probably should make a complete history on this one day. Anyway, yeah, you make your way around beautiful world, shooting bad guys, hiding indoors, and trying not to die under elevators, or as we call them, lifts. Seriously, guys, this game is absolutely outstanding, and is probably the game that I'm going to be coming back to the most on this machine. And for our final game in 1994, we have Dan Cougar, and even though my name takes up a third of that, it's another one-on-one -on -one fighter. You know how I feel about these games, guys. However, researching other people's reviews, it turns out that this game, that I'm actually completely fluking by the way, although may just look like another fighting game, actually brings some interesting ideas to the table. It's a sequel to that Kaiser Knuckle game and therefore it's probably the better game. I don't know. 1995's Puzzle Bobble 2X is next and it's a repackaged sequel to the original Puzzle Bobble, better known by us as Buster Move, the only puzzle game on this list that every single early PlayStation adopter would be well aware of and of course, it's good. It's a good thing that it's on here. Leaving the final game as 1995's Bubble Memories, yet another Bubble Bobble game. The fifth overall in the series, although third according to the poster, and it's pretty much the same game again. The final in the original trilogy, I suppose. You got a few additions, like bigger bosses and stuff like that, but it's pretty much the same in all honesty. Probably the best of the bunch, but I'm sure the hardcore Bubble Bobble fan out there will correct me on that. And there you have it. Those are the 40 packing games for this system. Now, you do also have an SD card slot on the side, which requires you to purchase the additional SD card, which comes with an extra 10 games that all work with the paddle controller that comes with that package, like Arkanaut and Poochie Carrot. But I don't have that. Of course, I did try and put a formatted SD card in there with some main ROMs, but of course, it didn't work and wasn't even recognized. Give it time, guys. Give it time. One of the issues I do have with this system, sadly, is the fact that there's no option to change the Japanese games into games from different languages. Of course, not all games made their way across the sea, but still, in the arcade space, the differences between the versions is pretty significant. It's a shame that they are just simply not available here. You do, however, have the ability to mess around with the game's dip switch settings, like change the amount of lives that you have, the amount of points per extra life. Each game's going to vary with what is available here, but still, it's a very nice addition that these options are included. I personally think that this collection of games on here is pretty solid. Only a handful of the 40 were really not for me. Some on here I know very well, and the ones I didn't are still great, and with them being on the system like this, they're going to be getting a hell of a lot of playtime from me. As stated, this isn't going to be a system for your kids, nor is it going to be a system that pops up on Facebook Marketplace after your Uncle Barry's had his five minutes of nostalgia with, like a NES Mini. This is a true collector's item in every single sense of the word. It's expensive, like properly expensive, especially if you get the bundles, and your opinions will vary if spending that sort of money on 40 or even 50 games is worth that price tag. But with only five thousand units the companies that are bringing it over know what they're doing this is going to sell out perhaps not right away it is a niche product after all but it does have a solid fan base and more importantly a solid list of games that do play very well thanks again for sending this to me i hope this has helped you decide if it's a system that you guys may or may not want to pick up make sure to subscribe for more content and hopefully i'll see you all next time